Hi everyone. Thanks for joining us, for tuning in and checking out this career retrospective. I'm Jason Dawsey, research historian at the National World War II Museum's Jenny Craig Institute for the Study of War and Democracy. And just delighted to have the opportunity today to do this interview, a career mm -hmm. retrospective with Dr. Michael Neufeld. I'm gonna say a little bit about Dr. Neufeld's biography. This is a, uh, a very abbreviated overview. Obviously in this retrospective, we're gonna be able to go into a great deal of detail about Dr. Neufeld's uh, interests, his, his background, his, his research. And I think we'll shed a lot of light on the long career of a public historian. Michael J. Neufeld retired in 2023 as a senior curator in the Space History Department of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. Born in Canada, he has four history degrees including a PhD from Johns Hopkins University in 1984. Neufeld has published numerous academic and popular articles and has written or edited nine books, notably The Rocket and the Reich from 1995, a biography of Werner von Braun from 2007, and Spaceflight, A Concise History in 2018. In 2017, Secretary David Scorton gave him the distinguished, the Smithsonian Distinguished Scholar Award, the institution's highest research honor. And Mike has had a one kind of uh, award that very few of us can, I think, aspire to, which is having an asteroid, asteroid 329018 Neufeld, named for him. So Mike, welcome. Thank you. Great to have you here today. Really um, looking forward to this conversation. You and I have been in touch for many years and so it's been great to follow your career and learn so much from your work and now having an opportunity to chat with you about that career in its totality. Thank you for having me. Great to have you. So where to start I guess Mike would be the fact that you your monograph on the Nazi rocket program, the biography of Werner von Braun, the history of space flight all alluded to in the intro are, are well-known works. But you began your career in German labor history, mm -hmm. in fact, 19th century German labor history. So I wanted to start by asking what drew you to that field of German labor mm -hmm. history. And then a quick follow up. You worked with Vernon Lidke, a great historian of the German workers movement, German social democracy. Could you tell me something about Vernon Lidke's impact on your research in that field? OK, so. I, I really, to understand how I ended up doing that for a while, German labor history, you have to really go to the backstory and why I ended up then coming back to space, space history stuff. So uh, in the 60s, I grew up in the 60s, a space buff. I mean, I was just at the exact right age to be totally caught up in it. 10 in 1961 when the first humans went into space and 18 when the astronauts landed on the moon. So, so I went into uh, engineering school at the University of Toronto in 1969 and flopped out. I, I then started over again at Calgary, uh, University of Calgary in 1970 uh, in physics and was good in everything but physics. And so at that point already, I was saying, okay, so I need to find an, a, a different way to go. <laughs> and because obviously my enthusiasm was for the science disciplines, but my uh, talent was not there in spite of very good grades in high school. So, uh, you know, I was, I was, had also been as a uh, teenager, a, a, a war gamer and a history buff. So I had a, read a lot of World War II history uh, and was interested in military history at the time. Uh, when I transferred over to the history department as a major at Calgary uh, in 71, um, you know, the real emphasis at that point was on conventional political history, but, you know, social and economic history was, was really rising at that point. Um, also, you know, given you know that that was the that was the the, the aftermath of the '60s, uh, my politics were left. Uh, so I was very interested in in labor movements, labor history, uh, history of socialist parties. I, as an undergraduate, I wrote um, a, a an honors thesis on 
the independent uh, German Independent Social Democratic Party, which was a left-wing breakaway during World War One, that it, that it, later on part of it ended up in the Communist Party. So I was already doing this. German social democratic history at the end of my undergraduate years in 74. I went to UBC. I took another, I started there is a, with a master's um, program in 1974. And UBC was, and the, and the Europeanists at UBC were very much into the modern social history movement. They were deeply into writing about that, thinking about that. So I went very much in that direction and I started turning much more towards a labor history, um, you know, in social and economic and not just conventional sort of history of trade unions and socialist, social democratic party. I should also say that I ended up doing German stuff somewhat as a, a, a little randomly because I was interested in continental European history and I was equally interested in French, German, and Russian but I'd never been any good in French in high, in, in high school in, in Alberta. And, and Russian sounded too difficult, and my name is German, so I said, hey, I'll, I'll just take German. So, so that was how I ended up doing <laughs> German history instead of Russian or French. Um, um, so anyway, to, to sort of get through all of that backstory, um, after taking two years off and working in the bush and traveling, I started at Johns Hopkins in 78, and I targeted Johns Hopkins because Vernon Lidke was a, a very well-known historian of the German Social Democratic Party and its culture, and uh, he seemed like the right advisor, and, uh, the, you know, and they offered me support to go there, otherwise it would not have been feasible to go to, to Johns Hopkins. Um, and, you know, I, I also intentionally aimed at uh, um, you know, American schools, I was very much conscious of how bad the job market was and how much in order to get the possibility of a, of a job in Canada, I'd probably need a, an elite degree. So, so Johns Hopkins seemed like a very good choice for me and Lidke was a good advisor for me. I mean, he was, you know, gave me a good, good grounding in modern German social and economic history and political history. And I also had a very good early modernist, Mac Walker, uh, very famous early modernist, Mac Walker, as well as, as, as British and American uh, economic history that I did with Luke Galambos and uh, David Spring. So it was, it was a good, uh, high quality PhD program uh, that attracted me. It's just interesting to kind of note here that mm -hmm. I think Vernon Lidke's The Outlawed Party mm -hmm. and The Alternative Culture were were major books, I think, for a lot of us that were interested in mm -hmm. social democracy, the, the German workers movement. So it's interesting, Mike, you and I have uh, at least some so, some common books, I think, that were yeah, influential think, for I mean, both of us. Yeah, the you know, alternative culture hadn't been written yet when I was a student between 78 and 84. But yeah, he was very much interested in going in that cultural history direction and away from what had, the outlawed party book was really about the Bismarckian outlawing of the Social Democratic Party between 1878 and 1890, and much more conventional history. And that's, sort of, that's how I followed the trend in social, social history at that time. And I went towards a more and more detailed uh, social history, which is how I ended up with writing a dissertation on the skilled metal workers of Nuremberg. Well, you gave me a perfect kind of segue then mm -hmm. into the second question, which is that you published the skilled metal workers of Nuremberg crafting class in the Industrial Revolution with Rutgers University Press in 1988. And normally, Mike, this would be seen as a real milestone for mm -hmm. a young historian. You have a monograph out with a very good university press. But in your case, you soon transitioned away from labor history to what really now we refer to as, as public history, as a career, um, to work at the National Air and Space Museum. So could you tell us how that happened, this transition? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so by the time that book came out, I was already leaving the field. So I barely stayed in it after PhD. And, and, and um, so I finished the PhD in 1984 with the dissertation on the skilled metalworks of Nuremberg. And I was living in far upstate New York near the Canadian border with my first wife uh, and um, teaching part-time mostly at that time. 
and I was trying to find a way forward in German labor history. What would I do next? What was the next project? That was going to be the inevitable job question when I started looking for, oh, for a job. Where do you, so, so this dissertation is going to be published, but what else do you, you know, what is your next project? So I started working on, you know, I did, a, I did one article that came out of the book and, uh, and I uh, was looking for a new pathway and, and I felt dead ended. I mean, in many ways, I was already feeling a little burned out on this whole area, which I had started as an undergraduate a dozen years before. And uh, and uh, another feeling I had about it was that the skilled metal workers of Nuremberg was so narrow and specialized. I mean, you know, we'd gone from studying the working class of a coal country to a single city, and now I was writing a specialized study on only part of the working class in only one city. So it felt more, and the and 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 the labor history was very, very sort of uh, uh, heavily into into a theory which I didn't feel like I was terribly good at and and I just never found you know what is the next project to follow that up so so I felt a little dead ended um, and around 85 or 86 you know I started getting interested in um, the German spaceflight movement because of the articles of Frank Winter who was at the air an historian at the Air and Space Museum um, because I, all through this period, I, I still had my parallel life as a space buff. So I was a member of the British Interplanetary Society. I was still following the space business very, very closely. And Frank published an article in the this BIS journal, Space Flight, about the, or the sort of history of the German uh, Verein für, für Raumschifffahrt, the, the Society for Space Travel. It was founded in 1927 and sort of fell apart early in the Third Reich. Um, and I said, boy, that's really interesting, but I could do the, a lot, I could do a lot better with that because I have a PhD in German history and I have the language and Frank always muddled through without really having command over the German, uh, and, um, said there's an opening there and somewhere around, I would say 86, I'm not quite sure exactly when this whole thing started, somewhere around 86, I said, you know, you know, maybe I should start working on that stuff as a second career, as a second as a second subject, because I don't know what to do. I was fortunate that, you know, when I was looking for a place for the manuscript for the revised dissertation, that this labor history series at Rutgers picked it up. So that, you know, I was fortunate to have it published at all because I mean, compared to my later books, it's extremely obscure and probably only sold like five hundred copies. So, um, so in uh, so I so uh, around '86 I got this idea, you know, there's really a crying need for a biography of Anna von Braun. Uh, uh, already that idea had occurred to me. It was uh, right at this time. It was also the period when um, uh, the first the re big revelations about von Braun's Nazi past came out at the end of 1984 with headlines in the New York Times and the Washington Post about the Arthur Rudolph case, and Rudolph had one of von Braun's close associates. So there was this beginning of opening up the Nazi question around von Braun. And, and I saw how, you know, 86, 87, I saw how weak the literature was, how, un, uh, how poor everything uh, was done, you know, how sort of, it was all hero worship and very poorly researched. Well, that takes us, you know, into the 1990s like in your career, mm -hmm. which were, to put it mildly in your case, extremely dense years. So why don't we start with your path-breaking 1995 monograph, The Rocket and the Reich, Pena Munda and the Coming of the Ballistic Missile Era. This was a classic work. So you could talk about this project and how you look back on this book now, mm -hmm. almost 30 years later. Okay, so to tell that story, I need to sort of backtrack to my career you know, or at least sure. is, is continue the career progress question and how, so, you know, I mean, in the, in the, in the mid to late eighties, I had a series of, I had three one year jobs, two, you know, one year at SUNY Oswego, two years at, at, at Colgate uh, University, all, both of them in sort of central uh, New York state. Um, and um, I was trying to figure out how to make a way forward, you know, in this 
rocket history area while still having a job or it, it was it was challenging because you know I was now um, uh, applying for jobs largely in social European social and economic history uh, in places around the United States while basically leaving it and I was also getting very interested in the history of technology but I didn't have any training in it beyond sort of somewhat in some, I always had an interest in the history of technologies that apply to the work process in factories and how that had affected the working workers, like in the metal working trades, which, you know, in the time of my book, they transitioned from small craft shops, really quasi, you know, late, early modern, almost quasi medieval world into a, a world of, of mechanization and industrialization in large factories, at least some large factories in Nuremberg. So I was interested in the history of technology, but now I was trying to do history of technology and rocketry and space life. So I was in the danger of falling between two stools. Mm -hmm. I was applying for jobs in social history, but I wasn't really, but I was leaving, I was more or less dro dropping it, and I was working on, on history of technology without having had any academic training in it. And, um, but getting interested in, okay, how was I going to do this? I heard about the fellowship program at the Air and Space Museum. And in, so in, in 1987-88, I applied for the fel fellowships at the Air and Space Museum. I was fortunate to be offered a uh, fellowship in 1988 at Air and Space um, to work on the Fun Brown biography. So I came in 88-89 as the a a a Alfred Verville Fellow in order to start the biography. And, and uh, But I, I got halfway into that year and I really changed my mind about what I needed to do. So I had come with the assumption that the German period of Peenemünde and the V2 and all of that was well done already. And then I realized that wasn't true, particularly after I read this pioneering German dissertation, Die Fauwaffen, from Heinz Dieter Hosken, the, the V weapons. Uh, and it unveiled the fact that there was all of this all these records in Germany, the sort of sur the surviving records of the whole Pain and Munder project, were in the, in in the military archive in Freiburg and in the Deutsches Museum in Munich. So I said, okay, you know, and I also saw the flaws in the Holzkin dissertation as well as the value. I also saw the flaws in what he hadn't really done, and he hadn't done much of anything with the 1930s. It was really about World War II. And he wasn't that interested in the history of technology. It was more or less a program history and operational history and so forth. So by the end, of, by, by, by the spring of 1989, I had come to the conclusion that a von Braun biography should wait, mm -hmm. that I really needed to change this into writing a history of the German rocket program. As I said, this was also the period of the revelations about about the concentration camp labor in the program, which were being unveiled by muckraking journalists, Tom Bauer, Linda Hunt, others had been publishing this muckraking literature about paperclip and about the scandals of, of some of the Germans who had come to the United States under Project Paperclip. So, uh, so I decided then, you know, to uh, to change my topic to this. History of the of the of the of the of the Third Reich rocket uh, Third Reich Army rocket program. Um, it's a yeah, it's a long and complicated story, but but it certainly was um, something that was an extremely fruitful topic. I mean, one of the things I, I liked about this topic is it was just so easy to sell to funding agencies. You know, so I got another fellowship for the next year at the Air and Space Museum. I also got an NSF grant. Um, the topic was golden. I mean, the combination of history of technology, the scandals, the, 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 the concentration, the new information on concentration camp labor, uh, everything was really um, important to, uh, it was easy to sell to, uh, unlike labor history, which tend to be extraordinarily narrow and specialized as it was developing in the 80s, 70s and 80s. This was easy to sell. Now, I was looking for a job, and so I actually went to like three tenure track interviews in 89, 90, didn't get any of those jobs, and, and I was still muddling through trying to just keep going year to year to year. And so when it came up to 
1990, I was fortunate that uh, a job became available at the Air and Space Museum. And um, so that in itself is a story. It relates to some of the we're gonna thing we're going to talk about later, the Enola Gay mm -hmm. affair. And, and, uh, but um, they had a job, which is officially the history of strategic bombing. And the new director at the, in 1987, Martin Harwit, was an astrophysicist who was very interested in changing the profile of the Air and Space Museum. Stop living in denial about you know, the realities of strategic bombing and the development of aircraft and nuclear weapons and everything else. And so he, created, he had this idea to create this blockbuster exhibit about, about strategic bombing, the Enola Gay and, the, and, and, and Hiroshima, targeted probably towards the 50th anniversary of Hiroshima in 1995. So we'll come back to that story in a minute, but how this relates is that they went through three job searches. On the, the first two, Harwit rejected the candidates because they were conventional Air Force historians, and that's not who he wanted. So that's the third time around, Tom Crouch, who had come back from American history to uh, be the chair of the aeronautics department at, at, uh, at Air and Space, uh, said, why don't you apply for this job? And I said, well, I have a problem. I'm a Canadian citizen. I can't take a civil service job. He said, okay, and that was how the flexibility at the time existed, didn't really exist later on. You know, we'll also open a trust fund, non-civil service job. And so they advertised it again with trust fund and civil service jobs. Uh, so I applied for the trust fund job. I was, I was lucky to get it. You know, I was fortunate that they, that's the kind of person that I think Harwood wanted and that Tom Crouch wanted. Uh, instead of a conventional Air Force historian. And so I ended up doing, in the 90s, I was a curator in the aeronautics department. And I was um, basically a World War II, I was basically the World War II specialist as I was hired at that time. Well, um, the, the, that, the exhibit did not take off right away for th reasons we can come back to. So I was fortunate to have Two, over two years as a fellow and probably and two more years early on as a curator uh, where I had not much of anything to do except work on the book that became The Rocket and the Reich. So I was able to dive deeply into that. I had an extraordinarily lucky uh, discovery uh, that a large fraction of the Panamunda records that had been um, had been microfilmed in the U.S. and that a set of that microfilm sat in the Air and Space Museum archives, which meant that I, I didn't have to go to 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 uh, Germany for a year or something like that. I could I could I could do most of the work in the Air and Space Museum and go there for a few weeks to fill in the parts that had for which there was no surviving microfilm. So um, so yeah, I was able to work on the rocket and the Reich. In, into into the in, into 93 94 just as this uh, sort of what ex, what became the Enola Gay exhibit was taking off um, you know in many ways I think that's the the best book I ever wrote I think it may be maybe even the more important book in terms of scholarship although the fun Brown book is better known uh, and and reaches a bigger audience because it also covers the American space pro program years of fun Brown uh, and, and, and an Army missile program years of Fun Brown, but um, you know I think it's a it's a, a really foundational work and it, and it got some got some prizes and I you know and I look on it as you know really very sound. I mean I don't think anybody has really has supplemented it, but they haven't really challenged anything that I've done in that book. It's a it's, it's such a superb book, and I would definitely recommend to our audience mm -hmm. to go check out. Um, Mike's book, check out The Rocket and the Reich. It gives this longer perspective. You talk mm -hmm. about these early attempts at, at mm -hmm. uh, thinking about space flight. There's some comparisons in there with mm -hmm. what's happening with the U.S. And you have some really interesting things to say, Mike, about technology and the kind mm -hmm. of the, the epilogue to that book, which I think readers mm -hmm. will find really interesting. And we may actually yeah. cover some of this in these other questions. I mean, I think one of the big substance aspects of that book is I 
it, I had to understand the technological revolution that took place at Peinamunda that created this missile, although, as I state at the end, was pretty much a military failure and a waste of time. It was a technological breakthrough that changed the world. You know, the aftermath of the World War II was the other powers all grabbed onto V2 technology and ran with it. So, you know, it was, and it, and it was the, 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 the route both towards the space launch vehicle and the ICBM. So it, it's a, the rocketry has this like two headed, Janus faced aspect that it's parallel uses. Often the very same rockets could be used to to put somebody into space or to launch a nuclear warhead on Moscow. Um, and uh, so, you know, it, uh, it was a, an important book because it also integrated the. Um, concentration camp story, the Nazi story. I mean, I, I think I never enjoyed writing a book more than that book because it simultaneously had all of these dimensions. It had the history of technology, the history of space flight. It had the history of the Third Reich. And there was a, a lot of pioneering, really important scholarship coming out in the 70s and 80s into the 90s about the, the history of the Third Reich and its institutions. It had the history of the Holocaust and, and concentration camp labor all of these things, and it had a military history. So all of these interests of mine sort of converged into one, you know, one volume. So yeah, as I said, I've never had more, I think I've never enjoyed doing a book more than I did that one. It's, it is such a rich book. And I, th I think mm -hmm. for, for readers, for our viewers, this argument about the Janus-faced aspect of rocket technology is so important. People tend to focus on one or the other, on, on mm. this is about space exploration, or people are focused on the nuclear weapons that um, are also tied mm -hmm. to this technology, right? And you show that you have to think about them together. And, and then actually, you've already mentioned, Mike, about how this book allowed you to, to tackle several different interests and we're going to be able to mm -hmm. to work that in and a couple of questions here you've already alluded though to the enola gay exhibit and you were there brought in um, at this time this is overlapping with your work on the nazi rocket program so you were there during the controversy over the smithsonian plans for an exhibition about the enola gay in 1994-95 could you share your recollections, Mike, about this major controversy? It's really part of mm -hmm. such a part of the history of the memory of World War II um, that erupted over this exhibition. Yeah, I mean, this was certainly one of the uh, biggest disasters in the history of American museums, and biggest controversy, the biggest, uh, most difficult controversies in the history of American museums. So, you know, I ended up not in the middle, I ended up being central to it. So as I, I, I accounted earlier, you know, I was hired to be the historian of strategic bombing, which was really for how it meant leading to the Enola Gay and what do we do about it. So a backstory on that is, you know, we got the Enola Gay airplane in uh, title to it in 1949. It did not, act, it would, and Enola Gay again was the airplane that is B-29 under, with, commanded by Paul Tibbets, who dropped, which dropped the bomb on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. And so, but the, but the Air Museum, as it was called before 1966, and was small, did not have its own building until 1976, uh, did not have proper storage facilities. Enola Gay was in parts out in an old storage area in Maryland was falling apart, being damaged by poor, by poor conditions and around and, and, uh, and, and, and it was always a problem for the museum. Well, how do we display this? And as, as, as you know, the, the country changed, as the anti-war movement grew up because of Vietnam, you know, the Air and Space Museum increasingly felt, well, well we just as soon just keep it hidden away. And anyway, it was too big to fit in the downtown mall museum, really. There really wasn't any place to show an airplane that large. So it was just a problem. When Harwood came into uh, the, uh, the directorship in 1987, he wanted to change all that. He wanted, as I mentioned earlier, he wanted to have an exhibit about strategic bombing in Enola Gay. Uh, he wanted to deal with these hard problems, this question. I mean, he was had an interesting biographical background of that. Um, he was in a prominent uh, astrophysicist, but he had been, uh, he was uh, 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 originally Czech Jew. His 
father who had been a professor was fortunate to flee Czechoslovakia in uh, 1938 or 1939 as the as a Nazi takeover took place. Uh, they uh, he got a job actually in Istanbul in Turkey, and, so, and they stayed the war in, in in Turkey, and then came to the U.S. right after World War II, emigrated the war after World War II. So Harwood then grew up in the U.S. to become a physicist, but then because he was a physicist, and this was the era of the draft, he was drafted into the army, and he was assigned to the H bomb test in the Pacific. So he was out actually witnessed some of the H bomb explosions out in the Pacific Islands. So we so we had this kind of unusual European uh, background, uh, academic, somewhat liberal politics, and this obvious under, sort of visceral understanding of nuclear bombs and the, and the danger of it. So he said, we want to change the Air and Space Museum. I think it was a noble idea. It didn't turn out well for him and, and, and anyways for the museum. So it's an extremely long and complicated story. I don't know if I want to, you know, unpack the whole thing. It would take an hour by itself. But uh, to try to try to abbreviate that, you know, as I said, the first two years of the era at, in aeronautics, I, it was kind of dormant. Harwood was kind of stymied because how are we going to do an exhibit about the Enola Gay? How are we going to assemble the airplane, which is too big to fit, on, fit in? We, I mean, we did one study where we demonstrated that if we cleared out the entire air transportation hall, and stuck it on the floor. You could barely fit the B-29 on the floor, but it was, you know, it was the impact was ridiculous, and it was really not feasible. I think he, for a while, he thought about having something on the mall that was not feasible. So towards the end of '92, he concluded, "Okay, I give in. We will have an exhibit where we just use the fuselage, the forward fuselage of the airplane." And as it was finally done, you know, we had the, the sort of tube-like fuselage of the B-29 with the nose gear and as you came into the gallery you could see you know the forward part of the Nola Gay with the name on the side of, and you know so you know you saw a significant fraction of the airplane because uh, there was no way to assemble it so in the end at the end of 92 which was also already very late two and a half years before this this this, this exhibit was supposed to open he agreed to have this you know, exhibit inside the Mall Museum with the fuselage of the Enola Gay. And so at that point, I started getting caught up in it. Just as I was trying to finish the rocket in the Reich in 93, I made, a, I made um, he and Tom Crouch went to Hiroshima and Nagasaki to talk to them about boring artifacts. And then I went with Tom and the exhibit designer, uh, Jake Jacobs. We went to Hiroshima and Nagasaki in, I think, April 1993. So that was extremely interesting. I mean, Harwood's idea, sort of a grand but ultimately ill-fated and, and, and ill-conceived idea, was that a 1995 50th anniversary exhibit about Enola Gay would be a great point for which Japan and America could come together and come to grips with the bomb. You know, and, and in hindsight, that looks like you know, just like a, a very bad idea. <laughs> but at the time, he was hoping for this blockbuster exhibit which would unite the two nations. Well, you know, we, so we went through 93, 94, planning this exhibit, planning the script, uh, and we had a script written for it by the beginning of 1994. Um, uh, and sort of, uh, I think the four major components of it, there was an opening area about early 1945, the war situation early 1945. Then there was a smaller unit called the decision to drop the bomb. Then there was a large unit with the airplane fuselage, which is about the 509th composite group and the, and, and, and the, and the airmen uh, 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 who had flown, you know, the, the Army Air Forces personnel under Tibbetts who had flown the atomic missions, and then there was a section about the uh, about the effect on the ground, what happened with the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki on the ground that included artifacts from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and then there was a epilogue about the Cold War and about how the nuclear arms race comes out of you know the atomic bombings and the development of the technology. So that was the exhibit as it was originally conceived. It was really a 1945 exhibit. It started at the beginning of 45 and sort of ended in late 45 with the aftermath of the atomic bomb with a postscript on, on, on the nuclear arms race. Uh, and we had offered that 
we, we, had, we created an advisory board, which was fairly eminent. We had Dick Hallion from the Air Force History Office. We had Edwin Bears, uh, I think at that time, who was a military historian then. I think he was at uh, the Park Service. We had, mm -hmm. we had Marty Sherwin, who was a prominent historian of, of, of the atomic bomb and of, of the nuclear weapons on this panel. And they said, it's a pretty good script. We like this script. It's fine. Uh, but the Air Force Association hated it. <laughs> so another part of that story is that in the towards the end of 93, the, the head of the Air Force Association, which is, I should say, a combination of a veterans organization and a lobby for the Air Force. So it really had its origins after World War II in the struggle of the Army Air Forces to become the U.S. Air Force. And they engaged, and they always had a very good public relations dimension to the Air Force. And this Air Force Association is kind of a non-government organization which can lobby for the Air Force since the Air Force can't inside the government. And so the Air Force Association leaders came to us, the, the, the head of the Air Force Association and the, and the guy who was then the editor of Air Force Magazine came to, and Harwood and I and Tom Crouch had lunch with them in what was then our a restaurant at the, at the museum at the end of 93. And basically they came to warn us of the, what this could, ha what, what their, their concern about this and how, you know, they thought we were going wrong on this and we were, you know, too liberal and too questioning of the atomic bombing. And, um, and I don't think we saw that as a, a big deal. We, we failed to see the danger. I think, and, and, and one of the keys was, although Tom and I were historians and we weren't really quite in the league of understanding that. Harwood, who I admire in many ways, or was a very good person, made a very big mistake, I think, with that. He did not understand the politics of Washington and how much the Air Force Association could mount an opposition to us. And so, but we promised them to, to offer them the script. And so we sent the script to the Air Force Association when we sent, when we sent it to the, the advisory board of historians. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, the opening salvo was an article in Air Force magazine at the, which, on April 1994, which came out at the end of March 1994, which is a wholesale attack on us and the script as, as anti-American, pro-Japanese, you know, uh, a, a, a traitors to the United States, basically. Uh, uh, it was a wholesale personal attack on us, and it became more personal as this campaign went on. And the campaign just, that just took off. I mean, it wasn't just the Air Force. The Air Force Association was relentless, but then it got into small town newspapers, and it got into new media outlets around the country, and it got into, and then the American Legion became activated and became angry. And so, and Congress started getting, you know, mail and angry calls. And so it's kind of like the very opening, the, exactly the point where the internet was still fairly small and primitive. Otherwise, in fact, in the internet age, it would have spread much faster and taken off much faster. And the whole thing wouldn't have lasted months. It would have been over in weeks. We would have collapsed where our opposition would have collapsed in, in days or weeks, I think, in the current environment. But the, this campaign against us got more and more nasty and personal and more and, and spread across newspapers and, uh, and support around the country was very poor, it was very weak, and opposition was high. And if you look at public opinion polling at the time, you realize that a lot of the American public was not necessarily uh, in favor of the atomic bomb on Japan or was ambivalent about it. But the minority who were passionate about the argument that the bomb ended the war and saved millions of lives, and it was the only possible way we could have ended the Japanese war, um, was, uh, was intense. They had passion on their side. They had the veterans organizations on their side. And, uh, you know, we were basically roadkill when and, and that campaign really happened in the summer of 94 into the fall of 94. And so there's a long, complicated story about how we, it was a very, you know, personally stressful, traumatic uh, experience. Uh, it was a long, complicated story, but in, in the end, 
you know, Harwood tried to negotiate his way out of the situation. You know, first we brought in the we brought in the American Legion and we vetted the script with them and you know, and the Air Force Association and other groups would try to appease them. And the appeasement meant we suppressed all of the artifacts from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We suppressed all the pictures of what happened on the ground when the bomb went off. We gutted the decision to drop the bomb section. So, I mean, here's an example of why an academic debate does not translate very well into, a, um, into a, an exhibit. There's an academic debate about, you know, what were the alternatives in 1945? What was the historical situation? There are various views on this from left to right, from conventional, traditional arguments, which certainly have a, you know, a sound historical basis for being arguing that the only real choice was to use the bomb to end the war. There are the, you know, the left-wing revisionists who said, you know, this was all about impressing, scaring Stalin, and it really didn't need to drop the bomb. There were middle positions. It was complicated. But you can't translate a complicated academic debate into exhibit labels very easily. It's not really the right forum for it. So, you know, we ended up with a, a vastly distorted exhibit. We added a massive new section on the Pacific War because emotionally it was very hard for people to say we can start in 1945 with this exhibit. We have to start with Pearl Harbor. Talk about Pearl Harbor. We have to talk about Japanese atrocities. We have to talk about Japanese mass murder and occupation and everything that happened and, and, and baton and everything that happened to American servicemen as well. How can you not talk about it? So we ended up create this exhibit migrated into this something that was, you know, completely different than what we started out for it. Started out. And Tom and I both felt like the exhibit had been grossly compromised. Tom had twice gone to Harwood and said, we should quit. We should just say, sorry, we just can't do this. You know, we'll show the airplane, no, so the airplane fuselage, and we're just not going to do this history because it's just too controversial. It just won't work. Harwood was too caught up in the idea that, that this would be uh, the great blockbuster exhibit, and he tried to save it, he tried to save it, and in short, there was... Another controversy and another controversy. And in January 1994, Harwood accidentally stumbled into a controversy over how many American service people would die in an invasion of Japan, a land invasion of Japan. And, and at that point, the Secretary of the Smithsonian, who had just come into office and had inherited this god-awful controversy, just said, that's it. We're stop. We quit. We're not doing this exhibit. We'll do a substitute exhibit, and there was like a, the, essentially the partly built exhibit was redone to emphasize the the 509th Composite Group. Who I should emphasize were you know heroic servicemen. They did their job. They were they they carried out a, a, a remarkable uh, uh, job in dealing with the atomic bomb. But that was all of basically the exhibit was about the restoration of the Enola Gay aircraft and about the about the American. Uh, uh, side of the atomic bomb, and that was it. And Tom and I were excluded from that, and then Harwood was sacrificed. He became the scapegoat. He was he was he was he resigned in May 1995. Uh, and uh, uh, I should say this about Tom Crouch: at the some point, the secretary said to him, "You know, well, you know, Tom, you're you're valuable to the museum." You're going to keep your job, but I don't know about Newfeld. And he and and Tom said to him, "If you fire him, I'm going to quit." And uh, I think he saved my job. But then Bar Harwood, the, uh, the the secretary, uh, whose name is escaping me right now, said to uh, was too afraid that Harwood was going to create a controversy in the congressional hearing. So then there was a congressional hearing, which is basically a show hearing, not really a serious hearing, but just a show hearing to show why Congress was so angry at the Air and Space Museum. Uh, and he didn't want Harwood to testify, so he had it forced him to resign. So Harwood was uh, out, and, uh, and uh, Tom and I had survived this mess. But it was really a, a trauma. It was also a trauma for American museums. I mean, it was really one of the most important contributions in the history of American museums because it showed kind of the limits of what you can do and what you can't do. It showed something about how it's really hard to do with this kind of exhibit in a national museum. 
you know, in a small museum on the side, it's more possible maybe to talk about this controversy about the bomb and what happened on the ground and everything else. But in the National Museum, in the shadow of the Capitol, where we were people and the Congress viewed us as representing the views of the American people, it was really impossible to debate whether the bomb was right or wrong, whether something should have been done about it. So, you know, you know, basically I came out of that essentially uh, into another period in the later 90s where I uh, particularly worked on these other books you want to get ask me about in a minute and also on uh, finished, you know, on the aftermath of publishing The Rocket and the Reich and also on some uh, aircraft restoration projects that I've been involved in. Mike, that's an extraordinary story. I, I think many of us could recall, I'm old enough to remember that, and, and the kind of anger that was mustered against the Air and Space Museum. But there were people like, I remember Barton Bernstein, the historian who mm. talked about a kind of vengeful patriotism that was being mm -hmm. utilized uh, against, against you and your colleagues at the Air and Space Museum, yeah. that certain topics especially as the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II was there, the Cold War was over, that uh, for many people, they just did not even want to have a debate about mm -hmm. the, the exhibit. They didn't really want to have a discussion about the, the morality or not, or the necessity or not. They mm -hmm. just simply yeah. didn't want to have the discussion at all. I mean, there are a lot of people who are, feel very strongly about the traditional argument, and I understand that's a perfectly legitimate argument, and you can argue that position. But yeah, the problem was that the, the, the controversy effectively said, you're not allowed to have any other opinion. You're not allowed to express any, any other opinion. It was not uncoincidental, I think, that this was, 94 was also the year of the election of the, uh, Newt Gingrich and a public, the, the culture war. So we've seen multi, you know, we've seen many iterations of the culture wars over the years, but the early mid nineties were another period of the year of the culture war. So we got caught up in that dynamic of being the, the, uh, the anti-American, you know, liberal curators who were, you know, revising as in falsifying the history of the bomb and the Enola gang. So uh, it was, uh, you know, a very painful experience for me personally, very difficult. Uh, and, I, and I had not written about this until I published an article last year. I just have not been willing to talk about it or write about it. So this, this and this article that I, that I published on the history of the Air and Space Museum and the romance of technological progress in many ways is the first time that I, that I ever talked about this whole thing. We appreciate Mike, your willingness to, to share mm -hmm. these recollections, especially as difficult an experience as that was for you. And, but you noted here that after it was clear you were going to be able to stay at the Air and Space Museum, you had these other projects going on after the Rocket and the Reich, and we want to make sure we cover these. There's some very mm -hmm. important books um, that would be, if people are aware of the Rocket and the Reich or your biography of Werner von Braun, they may not be aware of some of the other things you do. And I want to talk about two edited volumes, mm -hmm. both very important you were involved with in the 1990s. The first was the 1997 English translation of Yves Bayon's Planet Dora, a mm -hmm. memoir of the Holocaust and the birth of the space age. This is an incredible book for those who've not uh, seen it. So could you tell us, Mike, about who Ave Bayon was, your mm -hmm. connection to Bayon and your role in getting the book published. And what would you want our viewers to know about this volume? Well, I mean, it, it's, it's a memoir of, of a French survivor of the Dora camp. So, you know, and uh, although that would, I think, let me give you a little backstory of where this comes from. So, so in, uh, and I'm going to talk about it in, in tonight's event, but in, in, in 1943, when the Allies and when the RAF bombed Peinemünde, it forced uh, the Nazi leadership to say, if we want this missile, then called the A-4, to come to be finished, we probably have, we need to go underground. And so Himmler and Speer and others were, you know, contesting over this. The decision was to put this V-2 factory into, a, into, a, into tunnels in central Germany. And, and in order to staff that factory, Buchenwald uh, set, created a subcamp, which was first named, codenamed Dora. And, uh, and, and it was a camp originally inside the tunnels in terrible, disastrous conditions. 
and and and, uh, and and although they built a barracks camp outside at, in or in earlier forty four, which was better, it was it was a catastrophe at the outset. Thousands of uh, inmates died. Six thousand inmates died over the the winter of nineteen forty three forty three in finishing the tunnels and beginning the production process. And you know, von Braun is uh, Vanna von Braun was mixed up in that because he was the technical director of the Army Rocket Project as well as other key people. And so the V two ultimately is produced by this factory. Uh, Ultimately, when in its finished condition, a very modern high-tech factory, but half of its labor force were slaves of, uh, the, from a constant, SS concentration camp, Dora, which then was called Middlebau. The factory was called Mittelweck, Central Works. It was deliberately vague sort of code uh, name for it. Um, and Ibeon was one of the French resistance people who got sucked into this factory. So in fact, the, the majority of the population of Dora were uh, Polish and Russians, often POWs. And I have to underline at the beginning, it had no Jewish inmates, uh, or except maybe a few that were hiding their identity. Uh, it had the Jews, Jews, Jewish populations have been deported to the concentration camps and, and death camps of, of Poland and the East. And this was, uh, this camp was staffed by Poles, Russians, French, and Belgians. And the French and the Belgians actually were almost all resistance people. And because they were sort of racially favored, they tended to get the better jobs in the camp, including in the assembly and the factory work. So all their conditions were terrible, but the, the East Europeans' conditions were even worse. Um, uh, Eve had been a, um, a very young uh, resistance guy. I think he was like 16, 17. Uh, he was uh, 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 caught and imprisoned, shipped off to Buchenwald, and uh, and then at some point uh, early in the winter of 43, 44, shifted into Dora and and became one of this workforce inside the tunnels and, and survived horrible conditions. I mean, I think it's not very coincidental that many of these memoirists were like late teens, early 20s. They were young and and to survive that, you know, if you're all, even if you were in your 40s or later, your odds of survival were extremely low. You had to be very young and very resilient in order to survive that. So he managed to survive the war, and at some point in the post-war years, he wrote this memoir. Probably, it probably came out in the 80s. Now I'm forgetting when it came out in French. Planet Dora. Uh, someone who became a very close friend of mine in in Washington D.C., uh, 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 Gretchen Shaft had a lot of connections to the prisoners. And ha because her husband had a cousin who had died at Dora. And, and his story was he was a German communist who had fled to France during the Third Reich and then had married a French woman, but then got caught up in the Nazi occupation of France and, and ended up back in Buchenwald and then in Dora and died there. So she had a, a, a personal family connection to a survivor of Dora. So she was, and I don't remember exactly how this happened, but she was in the 90s, she was a friend of Yves Bayon or had met Yves Bayon because of her connections to the, to the survivor organizations. And so I met Eve in in, in, in Washington in the middle 90s sometime. And he said, you know, I had this English translation of my book done, but I can't figure out how to, I, can't, I haven't been able to publish it. So, so I took that on, and I don't even remember what years that was, but it must roughly coincide with this post Enola Gay situation. I took the translation, you know, I checked it, I corrected it in a few places, because uh, I, you know, I still had enough school French to get by with reading. I'm not not good at it, but with a dictionary and scoop and my my somewhat poor French, I was able to go through the translation and fix it. And then I was able to find a place for it uh, at at this publisher in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, in order to set a context for it, I wrote a 20 page history of of the of the Middle Bodora camp. Uh, so it's sort of an overview, a, a historical context, because the scholarship, enough scholarship had come out by the, the middle 90s now to write some kind of overview. So yeah, it was, it, it was a, a successful book because, you know, it's, it's a vivid memoir of what it was like. 
He, write, he doesn't actually write a personal memoir. He doesn't write it in the first person. He write it as a series of episodes. And about one particular episode, a striking episode, I asked him once, well, who, who's, who was that? He said, oh, well, that was me. That, that happened to me. You know, he thought he was going, he was accused of sabotage. And he said, this is it. I'm booked for the hanging next week, you know. But, it, but, but somehow they decided he hadn't sabotaged. And so he, he escaped that experience. And so, yeah, he survived the war, and then I be, he became a, you know, he was a friend of Gretchen, so he became a friend of mine, and he used to come and visit Washington fairly regularly into the early 2000s. It's, it's such a striking book. Like, it connects res, the resistance to the Nazi rocket program, to forced labor, to the Nazi camp system. So I think for our viewers out there, there's so much uh, you'll find in this work. It's it's a very difficult read at moments, but it's incredibly illuminating about all of these mm -hmm. connections. So uh, Planet Dora with Mike's uh, terrific overview for that book. In addition to Planet Dora, at the, mm -hmm. around the same time period, Mike, you and Michael Berenbaum, then of the recently opened United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in DC, have been working on a different mm -hmm. book, a very different book, The Bombing of Auschwitz, should the Allies have attempted it? Mm -hmm. So speaking of controversies, Mike, here's a, yet another one, a very mm -hmm. different controversy mm -hmm. related to the end of World War II, this time in the European theater. And this volume you did with Berenbaum came out of a 1993 conference. And that book mm -hmm. went through quite an odyssey to get published. So could you take us through the story yeah. behind the book and the controversy yeah. surrounding it? So the origin of this was that uh, the, uh, the Holocaust Museum approached us, I guess just working backwards in the calendar, it must have been in the fall of 92, about doing a joint symposium for the opening of the Holocaust Museum. So the Holocaust Museum opened in Washington in April 1993. And about two weeks or something like that afterwards, uh, after the opening, we had this uh, a bombing of Auschwitz um, uh, uh, workshop or mini conference. Uh, in the in the Smithsonian sort of underground uh, Dylan Ripley Center uh, under the castle, uh, and in uh, in later April 1993, and so we brought in some historians. We we did the debate for and against. So I should give a little historical context for why this happened. You know, in um, there had been people who had asked that question in World War II, and then again in a couple of people had asked that question in the, in the post-war years, why didn't we bomb Auschwitz? Couldn't we have stopped the camp, uh, stopped, the, stopped the death factory at, at some point? Um, the root of it was that in, uh, in, the, in the spring of 1944, the, the Nazis occupied Hungary and rounded up and deported most of the last surviving large Jewish uh, community in Europe. And so, what had happened often over the course of several years in other countries happened in Hungary in the course of only a few months between April, March, and, and July 1944. And, and most of the Jewish population of Hungary was deported to, to their death, except for basically the Budapest Jews, who mostly still hadn't been deported yet. And in the course of that extraordinarily rapid mass murder campaign, Several appeals came to Washington and London, do something, cut off the rail lines from Hungary to Auschwitz, bomb the camp, do something. And so there were these appeals to, ultimately to Roosevelt and Churchill, do something about the Hungarian Holocaust. Nothing was ever done as, and, and, and it took months for the, and, and the Allies were saying, basically, we don't want to divert, we are on a critical campaign to end the war. This was precisely at the time of the prepare, preparation for and the actual invasion of Western Europe, of course. And we can't, we don't want to divert forces, and it's a long, complicated story. But anyway, this whole thing came back to life, particularly in 1978 when David, David Wyman published The Abandonment of the Jews, his sort of history of American failure to do anything about the Holocaust. About, about the you know, failure to let many, many enough immigrate in the 30s and then failure to do anything during World War II. And one of his central arguments, which he also published as an article, 
was an argument that we could have bombed Auschwitz. There are many ways you could have bombed Auschwitz. Why didn't we do it? It was a failure. And so uh, this, the, Wyman's article and book took that whole argument and brought it well into the public domain. And then as a result of that, Dino Brugioni and one of his colleagues at the uh, uh, CIA's National Photographic Intelligence Center published an unpublished uh, booklet about images of Auschwitz that had been taken by U.S. Army Air Force's reconnaissance aircraft. And they were preparing for bombing the Monowitz factory, which is Auschwitz III camp was attached to the Monowitz Buna, Buna factory, which was supposed to manufacture synthetic oil and rubber. And so, in fact, in September 44, the Army Air Forces actually did bomb Buna and in the process accidentally dropped some, can some bombs on Auschwitz I, the original Auschwitz camp, and killed some, some, some guards. And so this sort of amplified the question. We had reconnaissance photographs. We'd, mm -hmm. we'd actually bombed adjacent to the factory. Why hadn't we done anything? So the, the dead, it took off as a debate. And so when the Holocaust Museum was built in the original um, the original uh, permanent exhibit in the museum pretty much f at one point featured a little section about this and pretty much accepted the Wyman thesis. You know, we could have done it, we should have done it, why didn't we do it? And so, but they realized it was a controversy, so we had this little conference and we, uh, you know, we brought in the sort of the, some of the people who had published foreign against um, articles about this story. Um, we found one Air Force historian, Jim Kitchens, who had really who had better credentials, who could talk about the the the, the why this was not really feasible, or why it was not a, why in in the context of 1944, bombing was extraordinarily inaccurate. Strategic bombing was pretty much dropping bombs, massive bombs over a large area because you couldn't very difficult to hit anything with accuracy. So you just had a carpet bomb in order. That's what happened to the cities of, of Germany and Japan. So uh, we had this little conference and, you know, Michael, who was then the head of the uh, Hol the uh, museum, uh, it was at the Center for Advanced Holocaust Research, I think it was called, um, uh, at the time. Uh, he was in the head of the research institute, I guess that's what it was called at the time. Uh, he said, we should go forward with an edited volume. So this was kind of like on the back burner, simultaneously with the Rock and the Right coming out. And then the Enola Gay affair on the back burner was this, uh, 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 this what do we do about getting a, together some kind of edited volume about the bombing of Auschwitz controversy. Um, so, I, I mean, I have a hard time placing exactly chronologically when these things happened, but I guess probably it was all post Enola Gay, really, that it ever had, I had any time to even deal with any of this. Um, Michael made some very good suggestions. He said, well, the, the conference presentations are not substantial enough for a book. So we should publish a set of documents. We publish a whole document set as an appendices for the book. And we should invite some other eminent historians like Walter LeCure, Deborah Lipschdat, and others. to. So they wrote new pieces about this. So the book essentially has the articles of the original controversy, then it has a section of other histor prominent historians reacting to the story, and then it has a, a collection of the documents which we collected from American and British archives. Uh, uh, so that essentially the documents of the appeals to Roosevelt and Churchill in the summer of 1944 and the failure of that to actually produce a result. Um, that, that book was finally sort of f finished in around 90, 1998. And, uh, and we thought we were on our way to a publication with uh, St. Martin's Press. It was it's a Holocaust Museum publication, but it was done with St. Martin's Press. And, uh, and then was essentially the whole thing was derailed. Uh, David Wyman uh, withdrew, his, uh, his, uh, withdrew the permission to put his article in the book. And, and had, that had the doing of a friend of his, a scholar who was a friend of his, I don't want to get into his name. And so the result was that Wyman pulled out of the book, 
I actually had, I'm forgetting it again, I actually have a page proof of the book with Wyman's article in it and, and we could not be printed. The whole, the whole thing was derailed at, 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 at St. Martin's and we had to go back and redo the book and we, had, we found another Air Force historian who wrote a pro bombing, an, who had published an article about the bombing who said, well, under certain circumstances, you could increase the precision of American bombing and maybe you could actually could hit the crematoria complexes. And so we, we published the revised version of the book in 2000. Uh, finally came out after, you know, this huge delay. Um, and uh, I still think it's the most, it's the one volume place, if you want to read about this controversy, uh, it's the one volume place to be. And uh, three years later, Kansas, University of Kansas Press issued a paperback version, which I think you can still buy. Well, for our viewers, Mike, it's worth pointing out, I didn't mention this earlier, mm -hmm. that we're doing this interview on Thursday, June 22nd, 2023. Mm -hmm. And there's still people quite frequently who bring up this, this controversy and the, the issue about why didn't the Allies bomb Auschwitz, the tracks in. And so your volume was already a major kind of moment in these discussions. And so would encourage our viewers to go and check out this mm -hmm. volume and whether in the paperback edition, yeah. uh, and which is easy to find and go through and see what the debate was about and how it's covered there in great detail. Yeah. I mean, I just want to say offhand what I really think, you know, my personal opinion is that the book course, my job was supposed to be editor, was to integrate the different points of view and make it, make it, pull it together. And my personal conclusion out of all this was that given the inaccuracy of bombing in 1944, an effective bombing raid was almost impossible. Uh, you certainly could have bombed Auschwitz II, might have caused some damage. There would have been a large scatter of bombs that would have also fallen on the barracks and killed prisoners. Um, I think the Allies did not understand, of course, that the prisoners saw themselves in a place where they would willingly die if they saw bombs fall on the SS. You know, uh, um, so, you know, in the end, I sort of concluded that a symbolic raid on Auschwitz would have been the right thing to do, uh, but a, an effective raid was not possible, and and even more so the, the the sort of the bugaboo of oh we could have cut off the railroad lines to Auschwitz, which was actually the original appeal from the Slovakian Jewish underground to the West to do something, was really a non-starter because you can't bomb rail lines at a distance of hundreds of miles except from high altitude bombing and what's your odds of cutting the line are small and the track repair happens quickly. So bombing the trail, the rail lines to Auschwitz was never a good idea. Bombing the crematoria complexes accurately would have been extremely difficult. So I think the other thing people miss is that this was also extremely late in the Holocaust. So the reality is that Virtually all the, the, the mass murder happened in 1942-43. And, and there was absolutely nothing the Allies could have done about it. I mean, what we should have done is admitted more of the German Jews in the 1930s, but at that point, there was no direct threat to most of the Jewish population of Europe, which was in Poland and the Soviet Union. And there was absolutely no... So any intervention the Allies could have made in the Holocaust would have been at the very end of it. And given the time it took, the, the first time the Allies had uh, air assets in a place that was feasible was when we occupied the southern, southern Italy and particularly got the air base at Foggia and around there. And when we occupied Foggia in that area, we had a location where it was possible to reach deep into sort of Hungary, Slovakia, Poland uh, uh, from, because going from England was really too far. Um, so that was the really the opportunity only existed in the summer of '44. The Allies passed on it, and in hindsight, I think we should have made a symbolic raid. But um, that's also a hindsight argument because it's hard to put yourself in the mentality of American leaders, British leaders in 1944, and understand, you know, what was going on and what the priorities were. Um, and so, you're and you're really pointing, Mike, to the fact that the Nazis put these camps in Poland knowing they were out of reach of Allied air power. They were often very remote areas to begin with. Mm -hmm. So it was just very difficult for 
certainly for the Western allies, of aircraft to, to reach those. And this is a very nuanced perspective you're giving us mm -hmm. about it's a very yeah. complex question. I mean, the argument is still there, and there's still work. It's like the argument over the over the dropping the bomb. There are many sides. It's possible to argue. There's not a right answer, and that's just my personal view of the of, you know what I came out of that whole uh, publication with. I think if nothing else, we can help mm -hmm. our viewers find in your this edited volume you did with Barenbaum some very serious considerations of this topic that will do mm -hmm. justice to it, mm -hmm. at least. So, Mike, you move after these two edited volumes, you come back to Werner von Braun. Mm -hmm. You return to the, the issue of doing a study of him. Your 2007 biography of von Braun is really the standard work in English on him, result of exhaustive archival research, many oral histories that you had done kind of feed into it. So let me ask here, what did you want by this point? You had done all of this other work. Mm -hmm. Now coming back to this original project, what did you want to accomplish with this book since there was already so much on Von Braun already? How did the, the end of the Cold War impact mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. writing of it? And do you feel like the book has won mm -hmm. the influence it deserves? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly the last question is yes, but um, the... Um, uh, so the backstory, of course, so going back to our, what we earlier talked about, you know, I had started a Fun Brown, I started at the Air and Space Museum as a fellow to write a Fun Brown biography. I had detoured from that to write the, the Rocket and the Reich, and 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 on the idea that it probably going to put off and and come back to writing a biography of Fun Brown later, and then of course all of that stuff happened in the '90s we just talked about. And so, you know, it, it was on the back burner until about 1998. And around 1998, with, kind of the, with the Plandora out, with the bombing of Auschwitz, we thought on its way to being published and, 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 and everything else, uh, I would be able to go back to the biography. I, I, I'll be honest with you, at first I was ambivalent about it. I mean, I, I felt like, okay, so I have to rehash all this history of Pain and Munda, which I've already written about once. And do I like this guy? Not particularly. Do I, do I, do I know how to write a biography? Not really. Um, and so, but I started it mostly because I didn't have a better idea of what to do. Uh, in, uh, I ran into, then I ran into a few sources that really brought out the personality. You know, there, I, one of them was that I discovered in the National Archives just in a in a in a um, uh, record group, it was basically the army had started out to write a an army rocket and missile history. It gathered a bunch of materials and then never and never published the Army Center for Military History never finished this book in it. So there was all this materials left in the National Archives. One of them was a copy of a profile of Fun Brown that had been written by the New Yorker in in early 1951. Which is now, which became the in the opening scene in in the Fun Brown biography. I use that that visit of the New Yorker writer to uh, Fun Brown in Huntsville in 1951, Huntsville, Alabama, in 1951, as the setup for the book, and 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 what was driving Fun Brown. And then I think in '99, I also had thought, read some of the letters to. Virtually every, per, all, virtually all the personal papers that Von Brown had before the end of the war were lost, and his family lost everything. And his parents had then moved to uh, Silesia, and that became Polish after World War II. And like all the other Germans in in, in sort of west, what became Western Poland, they were robbed of all their possessions there, and were forced out and ultimately forced as refugees into the West. And so the family had lost everything. And there was a bunch of letters that, however, that had been written between von Braun and his parents after they had successfully gotten out of Poland into, into, into the Western occupying, occupation zones of Germany in 1946-47 before he brought them back to, the, he brought them to the U.S. along with his new wife, who was actually a first cousin of his, uh, Maria von Quistorp. So, so there was this letters from the 46-47 and then another slug of letters after his parents went back to Germany in 52. And these were revealing and it, it provided a personality. It provided a sense of, okay, there's some, there's a, 
fascinating personality here that I can now get into writing about. Um, and so the challenge of the Fun Brown book was twofold. One was to re rewrite the history of the German spaceflight movie of the 20s and the 30s and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the Third Reich Army rocket program from a personal standpoint and do it in a, in a new sort of biographical way. And with rather skimpy paperwork, other than the stuff I'd already used for the rocket and the Reich, the skimpy personal uh, surviving data. And then for the US period, it was the massive amount of paper created by the US Army and NASA for the 50s and 60s, huge volume of the, this was really the, the height of the era of paper in government. You know, now we're in an era of everything is electronic and God knows where it is. It may all disappear and historians have a hard time writing about the, around our contemporary era because it's all supposed to be electronic, but is it being saved? But in, the, in this massive amount of paperwork I had to get through to write the U.S. Army and uh, NASA years and the post-NASA years of Fun Brown. Of, of Fun Brown. So, um, yeah, that was my major ju my major uh, task between uh, 1999 and 2007. In 1999, I also moved laterally from the aeronautics department back to the space history department, which is where I had been a fellow, uh, and, and made a more natural job for me. So it was a little artificial for me to be all these years writing about rocket development and space flight and, and ICBMs and so forth. On, and being in the aeronautics department. So I moved laterally over to space history in 99 and was able to f finish the book. It was also a reasonably quiet period for us for exhibits, except for the opening of the Udvar Hazy Center in 2003. We need to do some planning for artifacts for that. So I was able, fortunately, to be able to have the time to finish the book before I became the chair of space history in uh, 2007. Um, yeah, you have this amazing kind of Two tracks, Mike. I mean, you're you're obviously involved in all this curatorial work, and in all these mm -hmm. these major publications. And it was quite a moment. The Cold War had been over for mm -hmm. a decade and a half by this mm -hmm. point. I mean, it was a different time, right, mm -hmm. to present a study about Werner von Braun, yeah, as opposed to much so much of the controversies about Project Paperclip. We're mm -hmm. going to cover that some of yeah. our event tonight. But it's a different time, right, to, right. to reapproach re him. Yeah, so to, yeah, to come back to that, I know you'd asked me that original question about the Cold War. So I think that, you know, the Cold War moment certainly opened things up even more. But it already begun at the, in the late Cold War with the revelations about Project Paperclip, about Fun Brown and others. As I mentioned earlier, there was a the Office of Special Investigations, the so-called Nazi hunting unit of the, uh, the Justice Department, had started looking into the Fun Brown group. Fun Brown himself had died of cancer in 1977 at age 65 and sort of missed this whole controversy uh, uh, personally uh, due to his, for obviously, unfortunate early death for him and his, and, and, and his family. But, you know, he, he sort of by ended up not being directly involved with this because he was no longer alive. But Arthur Rudolph had one of his closest associates, and in 1984, he had uh, left the United States and you know, with a voluntary agreement with the Justice Department rather than contest a denaturalization uh, 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 procedure over the fact that he had been the, the uh, production manager inside the underground plant. And so that opened up the floodgates to uh, FOIA, which uh, the OSI collaborated with journalists in foying, you know, Freedom of Information Act to let go of this some of the paperclip uh, documentation. And so this controversy had taken off, taken off in the 80s. And then in you know, then with the collapse of the, the Soviet bloc in 1989 to 91, the opening up of East Germany, uh, the, 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 the collapse of East Germany and its unification with the West in, in 1990 opened up the story even more because the two key sites were connected to this story, Peenemünde and uh, uh, Nordhausen, the uh, Middlebau Dora camp, uh, were now accessible to the West, easily accessible to the West. And so then the question, then the whole public memory thing took off, you know, and there were a lot of documentaries, a lot of examinations about the, about the, about the opening of Peenemünde. A small museum was opened. There was controversy about that. There was the opening, the, the op what had originally been uh, 
in the in the East German communist period, there had been a small concentration camp memorial site at, at outside the tunnels at, where the where the barracks camp was, which emphasized only the communist resistance in the camp and pretty much left the rest of the story out. I mean, it was really inconvenient for the East Germans that the Soviets had been there, that they had rounded up all this equipment out of Middelbad Dora and had taken Germans to the Soviet Union and worked with, so that the fact that the Soviet connection to the post-war era and using German rocket engineers just as we had done was very inconvenient. So they just wanted to talk about that. But opening up the camp, to the public then create this whole discussion of the history of Middlebaugh Dora, which opened up this possibility of, like, for example, publishing Planet Dora in English. So um, the post-Cold War moment also, not only the late Cold War, but also, and the post-Cold War also opened up this ability to question the, rethink the space race story and the Apollo landing on the moon story, you know, and making Fun Brown only about space and only about landing on the moon, which was certainly an obsession with him personally. Uh, that one-sided Cold War emphasis, which had included a, a kind of whitewash of the records of Fun Brown and other key members of his group, you know, that fell apart between the Rudolph affair and the post-Cold War moment, the late war and late Cold War and post-Cold War moment. So yeah, there was a whole opening now now, you asked me about the Fun Brown situation. The interesting thing about the way that it developed, I mean, it took me 20 years to get from proposing originally to the museum to publishing Fun Brown. You know, and in the interim, I'd done the Rocket and the Reich, but it took me 20 years to finish that book. And, and I was always worried that somebody else was going to come along and do a good biography and undermine the case for my book. And that never happened. Um, never happened for a few reasons. Number one was the sort of Fun Brown loyalists continued to like, continued to like Aaron Stuhlinger, one of his key associates, who was not involved in any of the Nazi crimes at all, uh, a, a physicist who was cl very close to Fun Brown in the, in the, in the, in the Huntsville Germans. Um, he he uh, tried, found, tried to finish a biography, but it, you know, it wasn't very competent and it wasn't really historical and was sort of salvaged by Fred Ordway, who was a prominent kind of um, non-academic space historian connected to Fun Brown. So there's still the Fun Brown loyalist story, newer versions of it, not very competent. There was a couple of small books that weren't very good. The, in German, a couple of books were published which were sort of on the basis of anti-Fun Brown based on the revelations of the 80s and the 90s. But there still was not a substantial monograph or biography which tried to take all of the evidence and put them into one account, you know, to talk about the, and also took the, the technology, the science and technology seriously. So you get historians who are, who are either Fun Brown loyalists or Fun Brown, you know, haters or just like, or anti-Fun Brown. You have a very black and white literature, either he's our space hero or he's a Nazi war criminal, you know, this, the, and and he and von Braun is very polarizing. He's either you either the people tend to be either either he's a he's a he's a, he's a hero or he's a, he's a space hero. Or he's a war criminal, and there's no in between. And the whole challenge is to integrate these two stories into one book, and to take account and also to take the this, another problem was that almost none of the historians were competent his, historians of science and technology. And Stuhlinger obviously had the technical capability to do that, but he wasn't an historian. And so you just, this, the history of technology part was not taken seriously. Military history is not done well. The history of concentration camp stuff needed to be integrated. So, you know, my challenge was to take all of these streams and to unite them into one account that was also readable because I knew this had a huge audience. If I could find a way to pull this all together, there, there was a big audience for a book and to write something that could be read by the general public, which is also scholarly and founded on original research and footnoted. You know, I, it's like the rocket with the Rocket and the Reich, which I published in New York originally was uh, for the Free Press of Simon and Schuster, and with Fun Brown, which is published by the, one of the best publishers in the United States, Alfred A. Knopf. I said, footnotes non-negotiable, and well, in this case, endnotes non-negotiable. 
I will not accept, I cannot publish something that does not have references or does or has that inadequate reference system you sometimes see where there are page numbers tied to quotations in the book and there are page numbers in the back. No, I just had to have substance. But you know, the, the, the why these books were published in New York was because this topic was like, as I found out repeatedly, golden. People wanted to know it was important. It was an important national, it was an important public discussion in, in the United States and in Europe. And, you know, and there was a popular fascination with the V2, Peina Munda, and with Fun Brown and the space race that meant that it was saleable, even with all that, oh, <laughs> tens of, Tens and tens of pages of footnotes in the back did not stop it from being saleable in New York. It, it's certainly become the standard mm -hmm. biography of him in English, Mike. And, and so if people want to check your end notes where you're getting this, they're going to see this, this extensive uh, body of work that you cite. So if you don't mm -hmm. know the Werner von Braun biography, please do take a look at it. It is uh, really definitive. Your work on him, Mike, concluded, we can say, around 2010, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to neglect that your curatorial work, you know, around this time, too. You've, you've filled in some gaps here about mm -hmm. that and with earlier questions. So could you discuss now what you did or are still involved with at the Na National Air and Space Museum that's connected to World War II? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Yeah, a lot of what I've done more recently has moved away from that, but but I've never stopped having a one curatorial connection is collections. So during much of my period in aeronautics, I was the curator for German World War II airplanes, and so uh, you know we have this um, um, essentially booty collection from World War One and World War Two, and I had the World War Two. So we have this outstanding. Uh, often, unfortunately, even today, a lot of it is still sitting off in storage conditions, un, not unfinished and unrestored. But we have many, you know, rare aircraft of German World War II, where rare aircraft was sometimes the only one that exists, the mo most of which are now at the Udvar Hazi Center at our second place that opened, the big uh, uh, place that opened out by Dulles Airport in 2003, 2004. Um, so I was a curator of German World War II aircraft in that period. I tried to get the HE-162 uh, Volksjäger restored with the Luftwaffen Museum in Germany. That never worked out. In 1999, I transferred over to space history, and I took over the German World War II missiles. And I think I've had significantly more success, partly because they tend to be smaller and less more manageable in terms of restoration stories uh, of that. And so, you know, I'm, I've been... Over the years, I've been trying to work through getting rid of some of the duplication in the collection and in and, and, and restoring. In fact, just now, just in the last year, at the very end of my career, uh, I got the Encyon, which was a, a late war experimental anti-aircraft missile, never deployed, uh, restored by the Deutsches Technik Museum in Berlin. And as a result of our massive overhaul of the downtown museum, I... Um, uh, also, uh, the V1 and V2 came out of the downtown museum, and we finally were able to finally able to clean them up, strip them, research their history, and they are just now in this process in this year, 2023, being completed and painted. And we will both have new, much more accurate paint schemes for World War II. So I've been engaged in this kind of, and, and then in later, after 2008, I also took over uh, all early rockets and missiles up to 1945, which included the U.S. Robert Goddard rocket material from the 20s and 30s, and also um, the, um, the U.S. World War II missile experiments, basically experiment, mostly experimental missiles that U.S. had deployed, uh, had worked on, had deployed, you know, a glide bomb, the Bat glide bomb, and there were a few experiments that were deployed, but. You know, it was an era of experimentation of guided missiles, but not actually much actual application of guided missiles other than the, v, the German V-1 and V-2, which had made this spectacular appearance in the middle of 1944 uh, and had changed the course of warfare, but were actually militarily pretty much failures in terms of changing anything about what actually happened in World War II. So, so I've been engaged with that. In, in the later 
in the, in, in the 90s, I was officially the curator of the old World War II exhibit in the museum, but the Enola Gay affair made it impossible to change that exhibit. It was just like we were just, for years after the Enola Gay affair, the Air and Space Museum just sort of ran away from any military aviation exhibits. It was just too dangerous. We just viewed it as too, too controversial and dangerous. So we just did, so I didn't really have a, much of an exhibit effect on that period. In, when the, we opened the Udvar-Hazy Center, we had to fill out the new space hangar. So I was engaged there in gathering up the German World War II missiles uh, and U.S. World War II missiles and putting them into the space hangar and getting them ready to go. Um, uh, 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 Frank Winter was actually the primary one at that point who was still engaged with the U.S. World War II stuff. You, you go into the space hangar, you go to the right, there's this corner of essentially German World War II technology, including a lot of these rare anti-aircraft missiles. Air, I mean, the Germans built anti-aircraft missiles, they built air-to-air -air missiles, air-to-ground air missiles, they built the whole spectrum of things that you would see in the Cold War, and very little of it actually came to be. Uh, uh, it came to be deployed and, 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 or have a significant effect. It was most, I mean, the irony of the whole German missile program was that it, it helped the Allies after the war. It became the basis for U.S. and Soviet missile development after World War II. So that was another thing I was engaged in. And then um, more recently on World War II, uh, uh, when, so, just to give a, you know, try to telescope an extraordinarily long, complicated story, the Air and Space Museum is now in the middle of a massive overhaul of the downtown museum. And as we got into the, you know, in, 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 the, in, it was start, in 2015, we decided that we couldn't fix the old building. We had to really gut it and rebuild it. Uh, and both the exterior stone and the interior systems were worn out. Um, and so in the course of that, um, I had been working for several years on uh, the moon exhibit and trying to get a moon, uh, get, uh, get the Apollo moon exhibit redone. I, I was the lead curator of Destination Moon, but I, I, was, I also volunteered as a secondary person on the new World War II exhibit. So, and I, and I sold the idea that the V1 buzz bomb should be in the World War II exhibit. So, so I've been a, this secondary member of the World War II exhibit, which is going to open in 2025. Um, and it will have the V1 in it. And also, I should mention, because I was involved in writing a lot of the start parts about Soviet air power, it also has an IL-2 Sturmovik in it. So for the first time, we're really going to treat, at least in, in very abbreviated form, with a major Soviet aircraft, something about the air war on the Eastern Front rather than doing what virtually all museums in, the, in this half of the world do, which is ignore it, uh, ignore the Soviet contribution to World War II. So anyway, that's, that's World War II stuff. I mean, as I said, I've been heavily engaged in space stuff as a curator, and I was a curator of Mercury and Gemini spacecraft for years also. And, uh, and uh, so I've been doing all this space stuff on the, uh, as another line of what I've been working on. Well, it must be obviously very satisfying, like to have been involved in all these exciting mm -hmm. projects. I think mm -hmm. for any of us who have been to the National Air and Space Museum, it's mm -hmm. such it's such a, a stunning place to visit. Mm -hmm. And I, again, it must be really um, satisfying to say, "Yeah, look, I was part of that. I, mm -hmm. I contributed yeah. to those things. I was really involved." And and you mentioned this this other side of your work connected to, but less directly related to World War II. We won't, we'd be remiss if we didn't say at least one question about it here in our last couple of questions, Mike, you've uh, you really attempted to demonstrate for, for national and international audiences the links between the Third Reich, World War II and the Holocaust and the era of the ballistic missile and space exploration. There's uh, much excitement, uh, perhaps mixed with a little apprehension about the condition of our planet, about a new era of space exploration. And you wrote this 2018 History of Space Flight. It's a wonderful book in addition to many articles in the U.S. space program. So I just wanted to ask you, Mike, since we have you here, about what are your thoughts about the future of human beings in space and what kind of historical mm -hmm. awareness mm -hmm. of space exploration do you want to impart to our viewers? 
Well, when I wrote the, so the reason I wrote this, this short little book, which is in a series, uh, essential knowledge series at MIT Press, was, you know, really uh, only 35,000 words, something like that. It's a, I wanted to rethink the history of spaceflight, uh, partly based on what I had written before, you know, and uh, uh, among the things that I wanted to do was to say, it's, hey, it's not just about astronauts. It's not just about human spaceflight. It has this roots in the, in, in the Cold War. It has a roots in the nuclear arms race. Much of the technology of the space race was, ex was available in after Sputnik, and for Sputnik and after Sputnik because of the whole ICBM race had allowed us to create these weapons that could loft a nuclear bomb to the other side of the world or they could put something in orbit. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so I want to rethink the history of space flight to note to people in this book that, that 90 plus percent of what we do in space has nothing to do with humans in space. I'm not denigrating human space flight. I'm just saying most of what we do in space is not about exploring space. It's not about sending humans into space. It's about creating an infrastructure that surrounds the Earth. So we build a space infrastructure and notable things that impact daily life are GPS, worldwide communications, worldwide weather, uh, climate and climate now climate observation. Uh, and so uh, and, and, uh, ballistic missile early warning systems, uh, reconnaissance systems, I mean, one of the reasons why we didn't have a nuclear war is that the two sides built reconnaissance satellites and then had a way to verify arms control treaties, uh, which, they, which in the Cold War era, on the ground inspection was impossible. So satellites made it possible to, to at least give a hope of controlling the arms race and preventing a nuclear war. So, so you know, Satellite technology has surrounded the Earth, and that, it, and, and we've annexed the area between geostationary orbit down to the surface of the Earth, and employed it for servicing the Earth. Another, of course, a major thing is is the robotic exploration of the solar system, as well as the launching of space telescopes, the exploration outwards. And so, you know, human spaceflight sort of bookends the book at the beginning and at the end, and I talk about it, and it, you know. I think that we are we are obviously going back to the moon now with humans. We are, and the Chinese are very determined. And I think that new there won't be a new space race in the Cold War sense, but I think there will be that rivalry with China is certainly going to mean that we are going to send humans to the moon. We are going to try to explore cis lunar space with humans. A key question is: uh, Is it sustainable? Will we continue to do that? I mean, major questions hover around the human body's ability to withstand the radiation of deep space, the prolonged zero or low G environments. Do we, are we equipped as bodies evolved in a 1G, or an environment of 1G with the atmosphere we have for deep space? That is an open question. I mean, all the rhetoric about exploring the moon is we have to develop the technology to go to Mars, and I think that's legitimate. The question is, do we need to go to Mars with humans? Should we go to Mars with humans? That's the, these are all debates for the future. So space is extraordinarily become extraordinarily important to the Earth, but not just, but not primarily because astronauts are going there. But I think fundamentally, humans want to, or at least some humans, not all humans, but some adventurous humans, such as the ones who want to go down to the Titanic and are just watching this controversy as this interview is happening, you know, watching this, this, this drama, will they be rescued? You know, people, some people do want to have adventures. They do want to go into deep space. Some people feel the drive to explore. And I think the population as a whole has a hard time identifying with robotic spacecraft, but they identify with another human doing it. So I don't think human spaceflight is going to stop, or but there are these open questions, and you know, and some of the futurists have said, you know, humans aren't adapted to deep space. Maybe it's our cyborgs. Maybe it's the AI systems that wipe us out. I don't know. Maybe they will explore such space <laughs> and not us. Those are, those are that's way off in the future. But you know, space has been really important. But as I've always pointed out, you know, it's this dual use reality that the same technologies that can be used for war can be used for space and vice versa. And that's always been the case. As we develop more technological capabilities for 
deep space exploration, we also develop new military scenarios and new military technologies. And the question, you know, hovers over us is basically between that and our, you know, massive outpouring of greenhouse gases and the effect that's going to have on the planet, you know, can we survive our own technology? Are we, or how many of us are going to survive our own technology? I don't have much doubt that humans will survive or some humans will survive. The question is, can we manage our way out of the mess that we've created, you know, and create a better world in the 21st, 22nd century? Um, that's a huge challenge of the present. Well, these are just such uh, fascinating and, mm -hmm. and crucial questions. Mike, you've given us a lot mm -hmm. to, to, to consider just for mm -hmm. those observations where you're even kind of moving into some very kind of philosophical considerations about mm -hmm. where we're at as a species, where our planet is, et cetera. So there's always the question, Mike, with things like this, a career overview is, is where to wrap up. Mm -hmm. And so this is the final question for, uh, for this mm -hmm. very lengthy and, and fascinating interview, um, mm -hmm. gotten so much out of it. So what I thought I'd ask, Mike, in concluding is how do you, you know, in, in retrospect, regard your own lar you know, long and very productive career as a public historian? And what do you think this work has really meant to you as, mm -hmm. as a scholar who's, whose life has been for at least three decades now very much tied to being out in the public with the work mm -hmm. you do? Yeah. So, I mean, I, as, as I mentioned when we met yesterday, I, I long time I did not really even accept the label of public historian. At some level, at some personal level, I would still feel I'm an historian. I'm, I was just an historian. Public history was not. Some, I was not. I did. I, now there are there are degrees and programs for public history, and those are very good things to have. You know, training people from the outset to think about themselves as reaching to the public and not just talking among themselves. I was. I came up in in grad school very much in the insular kind of. We're doing elite history here. Writing popular history is a sellout. We don't do that, you know. So write for your academic colleagues. That's where you're actually going to change the substance of history. Writing writing on original documents and archives and writing original history. So I became a public historian sort of by accident because I fell into a job at the Air and Space Museum, which was, you know, in spite of that one, you know, awful uh, period of the Enola Gay affair, you know, it's an incredibly rewarding and interesting career. And I think in many ways, you know, of course, most of, most of the, my colleagues and most of the people who have PhDs in history end up teaching in university, and that's another way of reaching the public. That's another way of educating the public. Uh, but, you know, they're writing mostly for each, where historians and other academics are writing mostly for each other. You know, being in a museum kind of through the back door sort of gradually acclimatized me to the fact that, you know, it's not enough to just write for your colleagues all the time. I mean, it's certainly a totally, a completely legitimate disciplinary thing to do to write specialized articles that only other specialists want to read. This is absolutely important and should be done. But, you know, being in a museum, you have to talk to the public you know, in several different ways. There's talking through formal exhibits, but there's also lecturing and in more modern periods, blogging and, and writing for the website and all those kinds of things and reaching out. And the second thing that happened was just because of the nature of my, the topic that I chose on the Nazi rocket program and on Thun Brown, it had a large popular interest. So as I mentioned, that made that possible to write for the public and, and offered a broader audience. And, and when I wrote those books, as I mentioned before, my objective was always to simultaneously write for my academic colleagues and write something that would be accepted in the discipline as substantial and legitimate, and at the same time, write it such that the public could read it and the well-educated the, the well -educated reader could get a lot out of it, even if they didn't care about the academic debates underneath it, you know, or some of those kinds of things. But to write it in a way that could reach a broader audience. And that way, you know, for us historians, that means you're influencing many more people than just, you know, the 25 people or 200 people, if you're lucky, in your discipline who care about what you write about, you know, but you're, you have the capacity to write, reach thousands of people not, in, instead of a very narrow and specialized academic group. So, so and, and of course, as I worked through my career, you know, I, I had, you know, 
exhibit opportunities, <laughs> both in both negative with a Enola Gay and with very positive with the development of the Hazi Center, and then with the with the, the the Moon exhibit, which also spun off a national tour of the Apollo uh, 11 command module in 2017 to 2020. So, so I, I, you know, had other ways of reaching the public. So, yeah, I mean, it's been an extraordinary career. I've been extremely lucky to have it. I should underline, given how, you know, just getting out of a PhD, going from one year job to one year job to fellowships, I was just stringing together things and saying, you know, where am I going to end up? What career am I going to have? Where am I going to work? I have no idea. I just got to get through the next year. So finding a place in the Air and Space Museum has been incredibly uh, rewarding for me personally in terms of uh, having a place to work that's important and interesting and corresponds closely to my, my own personal passions and interests. Well, Mike, you've certainly been one of the most influential public historians doing work related mm -hmm. to the Second World War. And so it's just been terrific mm -hmm. to have this conversation with you. So thank you very much yeah. for sharing yeah, so and, much. And, and before I finish, I do want to thank, you know, my colleagues at the Air and Space Museum, my wife, Karen Levenbach, for all the support over these years. She's went through a lot with me, including the Nola Gay Affair. Uh, you know, and um, uh, you know, and colleagues who have also helped me along the way, Tom Crouch, uh, David Dvorkin, and others. Wonderful. Well, Mike, thank you for for this opportunity to do mm -hmm. this interview with you. This has been uh, this has been fantastic, and we hope that our viewers out there get as much out of this as I have. And want to thank you for joining us, and hope to see you again at future events at the National World War II Museum. Thank you.